This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. I met Janet in 1990-something, um, when she was running a conference at King Alfred's College, which is now University of Winchester, um, on domestic space, um, reading the 19th century interior. And I offered to give a paper on working class American interiors, um, kitchens, sewers, things like that. And that became a book called Reading the 19th Century Interior, which you edited along with Inga Bryden. Um, um, Janet next became involved in organizing a conference which was held in London, um, becoming visible, the presence of women in late 19th century American culture, where I disrupted the whole thing by contesting the title um, as it was originally. Yes. Um, it was becoming visible. Was it becoming visible? Becoming visible, visible women. Yes, visible women. Visible women. And I argued about, vis uh, about visibility and what it meant and whether women were. And of course they had been, mm. which was um, sort mm. of the basis. But those, those books, um, I think, have had an important impact on the discipline because they brought together literature and history in ways that sometimes happen at American mm -hmm. Studies conferences, but don't really. And in the process of that, included one of her own articles, Magnificent Equipment, Body, Sound, and Space in the Representation of Female Singers, which is marvelous because it really, as an article, pulls together so many of the images and examines oral culture, A-U-R-A-L, um, as well as visual culture. Her monograph, Claiming and Speculations, uh, Mining and Writing in the Gilded Age, again, moves out of the Atlantic coast and, I was going to say, Eastern-centric um, American history. Because after all, most American history seems to be about Boston um, and its environs, uh, reflecting the importance of Harvard as a factory uh, for production of American historians. And then you have the Southern history. But Northern history, Northeastern history, is, is American history. And then you have Southern history and you have Western history. In other words, history itself is othered. Um, before you even get to issues of race and gender. Um, and she's also published, I love, Feelings of Silverland, Sagebrush Journalism in Virginia City's Flush Times. <laughs> Again, looking at the West uh, rather than the East. In the process of all of this, and writing The Recipe Reader, Narratives, Context, Traditions, um, an edited collection with Laura Cross, um, and writing the pioneer woman. I think Janet has is one of the few people working in women's history or gender history in Britain on the United States that actually takes the West seriously um, and also moved from. King Alfred's College up to King's College London, you know, keeping the K in the title <laughs> very easy. It's completely intentional. Yes, of course it was. Um, and has turned her career in, into something, I think, more high power, high visibility, and obviously so because she's speaking here on letter writing, friendship, and the foot gilder correspondence. Yes. Right. Okay, so what I'm going to do, because we, we've started quite late and I don't want to um, 
wear you into the ground. Um, and I don't know, well, we'll see, we'll see how we go. I've got quite a lot of um, material from letters. And I think you may be interested in, in talking about that. Um, so I've got a little talk in four parts. And what I want to do in the first bit is to look at the way that we as historians of women um, have come to understand a particular friendship, um, the friendship between Mary Hopefoot and Helen Gilder, one of the great correspondences of the 19th century, um, and a, a, a really powerful wellspring of writing about women's friendship and, um, and, and women's sexuality, women's culture in the 19th century. And then I want to talk a bit more about what we might try to understand about friendship in the 19th century. And then in the third and fourth bits, um, how friendship can be articulated in text. Um, and this is part of a new project, um, which is an investigation of friendship and the significance of friendship um, in the late 19th century. Um, and um, the, it's, a, it's an investigation um, of friendship that, that sometimes reaches a peculiar intensity between women, but it's not a study um, exclusively of women's friendship. So, um, I'm going to um, start with um, Carol Smith Rosenberg's recovery, as I obviously would, of the relationship between um, two college friends whom she calls Molly and Helena. Um, in the article which we all know, uh, published in 1975, The Female World of Love and Ritual Relations Between Women in the 19th Century America, um, an article that has, um, as the adversary um, edition of uh, Journal of Women's History said, it's become, that article has become a kind of obligatory reference and model for discussions um, of, of female friendship, particularly in the um, 19th century. And that article was the way um, that we all came to know um, of the friendship between these particular women. Um, and this is how um, Smith Rosenberg summarises it. Molly and Helena met in 1868 while both attended the Cooper Institute School of Design for Women in, the, in New York City. For several years, these young women studied and explored the city together, visited each other's families, and formed part of a social network of other artistic young women. Gradually, over the years, their initial friendship deepened into a close, intimate bond which continued throughout their lives. So, Smith Rosenberg illustrated the depth and the intensity that she attributed to this and other relationships that she talks about in the article. Um, she argued um, um, that they had this way with passages of Molly's letters to uh, Helena. Um, and she argued that their weight and centrality in women's lives derived from the way in which friendship between women intersected with um, relationships between female family members, aunts, sisters, cousins, daughters, mothers, and so on. And um, this kind of friendship um, derived, not only, um, not only sort of flowered in families, but um, also derived from the shared experience um, of a reproductive life, contraception, miscarriage, childbirth, um, as well as from um, the, the so-called separation of spheres. Um, and she quoted, Smith Rosenberg quoted, Molly's um, um, statement that her relationship to Helena was like that, that of um, a, a wife to um, her husband. It was, it had, um, it, it, it had that ideal, all-fulfilling and companionate form. So the letter correspondence between Molly and Helena exemplified for Smith Rosenberg another further, very profound correspondence in experience and understanding um, between the two women. And uh, that understanding um, and correspondence suggested a still broader common experience of intimacy shared by white heterosexual middle class women in the 18th and 19th centuries. And as Margareta Jolly um, pointed out in an, uh, a 2008 article called The Feminist World of Love and Ritual, um, this um, intimacy that Smith Rosenberg formulated took on a new life in the 20th century as feminist writers, academics, um, activists explicitly began to connect the form of the letter um, to evolving ideas um, about women's ways of relation to one another. Um, and Smith Rosenberg herself ventured the view or the hope that um, uh, she said there are indications in contemporary sociological and psychological literature 
that female closeness and support networks have continued into the 19th century. So it was an ongoing sweep um, of, of a woman's tradition. And that now it existed among what she called ethnic and working class groups, um, as well as the middle class. So this utopian vision of corresponding experiences in every sense, shared by women, for Smith Rosenberg trumped all the trumped the significance of all other experiences and most variables of background. So this is how Mary Halleck Foote, a successful writer, illustrated the national reputation before and after her marriage. A woman who lived much of her married life in the same domestic space as moving populations of engineers, in domestic spaces designed for such usage. This explains how uh, Mary Halleck Foote became, in Smith Rosenberg's female world of love and ritual, Molly. That was her sort of key identifying form, um, which was the name she used to um, sign letters to her friends and family. And in the same way, this is how Helena Gilda, a powerful and celebrated cultural activist in New York, uh, was represented by Smith Rosenberg in a footnote simply as Helena, a New York friend. So their intimate relationship is kind of in that article sealed away in this rich um, emotional private exchange. So uh, what I want to talk about um, um, now um, is I want to well I want to look at this friendship between Foot and Gilda in a different light. Um, Smith Rosenberg started from a position um, where she thought about the ways in which women thought of and interacted with one another as illustrating continuity, not discontinuity, and where modes of behaviour between middle class female friends remained unchanged across a couple of centuries. And for me, the Frick Gilda correspondence seems to suggest a very different, a much more historically effective view, um, a, a, and a, a very different conduct of friendship, a very specific conduct of friendship. Having said that, I think there's no question that middle class women and possibly middle class men, um, and I'm focusing on the 1870s and 1880s, shared the same utopian vision of friendship as Smith Rosenberg. Um, a tradition of thinking about friendship that goes back to classical ideas about the pureness of friendship, um, its potential as a foundation of the range of human bonds. And that kind of idealism was certainly alive and well um, amongst American romantics who perceived of um, friendship to be sort of beyond measure, that it should always be um, without limits. Harriet Prescott Spofford, in her little group of friends, her little book of friends, 1960, and many people wrote books like this, describes something very similar to what Smith Rosenberg calls the odyssey of friendship. Um, of, of um, Foot and Gilda. So, Spofford, um, when I first saw Annie Fields, she had come in Mr. Fields to take me on a long drive, and she was a vision of youth and beauty, a tall, regnant young being. When I last saw her, she had again come to take me to drive, no longer in the highest state of a young queen, but with a countenance as beautiful in its pallor, the eyes as soft and brown, the outlines as firm, but all silvered with the frost of age. Early in her life, the woes of the outer world possession of her. And Annie Fields, in turn, when writing the life of her friend Celia Thaxter, collected a series of letters with a sense, um, as with Smith Rosenberg's sense, um, that the, the letter expresses the self um, with um, a complete authenticity. But Spofford's work was a memoir, and Fields' book about Thaxter was a memorial. Um, Looking at friendship, the friendship of Mary Halford and Helena Gilda as it was conducted and constructed in letters, I think takes us in very different directions to this. Even memorialising the friendship took foot in very different directions. But um, before I, I, I look at a few letters to illustrate that, I want to say something about friendship itself. Smith Rosenberg acknowledged that friendship is not always understood in the same terms, so she says it's clearly difficult from a distance of 100 years and from a post-Freudian cultural perspective to decide the complexities of Molly and Helen's relationship. But what for her, uh, for Smith Rosenberg, just needs to be borne in mind for me um, is a point of departure. And my interest in this correspondence has drawn me to think about historicizing friendship much more precisely and to look at how particular moments generate understandings and formations of friendship. 
of course we live now uh, in the 2010s in a world crowded with anxious cultural argument about friends, friendship, friending. Um, and the premise that I'm trying to work with at the moment is that the same is true in the 80s, 70s and 80s. And among other friendship relations, I'm trying to recover the friendships that Helena Gilda, by all accounts, a woman devoted to friendship as an idea, to its assiduous nurture, to performance of it regularly and repeatedly um, in the 1870s and, and the 1880s. What reading about friendship in the modern era makes evident, though, is that whatever heightened degree of significance is given to friendship, um, this is a relationship that has warring elements. And the weight given to it is always matched um, by its fragility and uncertainty. In its broadest terms, the Western emphasis on friendship as opposed to kinship is clearly an effect of modernity, movement and migration, the emphasis on autonomy. Friendship's voluntary quality both matches capitalism's shifting relations and also seems at the same time to offer an antidote to it. The Guild of Foot corresponds with certain gravity and distance in Foot's preference for staying away from New York um, and commuting to New York when necessary and then in her migration to the far west. For all the apparent spontaneity to voluntary friendship, though, and its apparent separation from institutes that involve, institutions that involve obligatory ritual, marriage and family, still, um, as Sandra Bell's and Coleman argue, friendship relationships are frequently pre-arranged. They are characteristically formed within a relatively dense web of other relationships of kin and friendship. So the tight circle around her and the Gilda, including her brother and her husband's sister, as well as friends from college, um, and this is what um, formed her dense web of friendship. But dense or not, friendship in such set settings needed to be negotiated carefully in what Simon calls degrees of invasion, invasion and reserve, revelation and concealment. On the one hand, would be friends must tread carefully, as Emma Lazarus found when she attempted to become part of Gilda's friendship circle, lavishing attention on her and her brother. On the other hand, friends cannot easily terminate their relationship with friendships. Friendship issues of loyalty and betrayal figure prominently in thinking about friendships and friendship narratives. The demise of other friends and its lessons for still favoured friends form part of the texture of friendship. And then, in an econ economic setting where each must make her or his own way, how far can friendship remain free of calculation? How carefully must friends maintain codes of disinterestedness? Foote showed her awareness of this issue in a metaphor that likened friendship to a process of earning and saving. I must not, she wrote, draw too heavily on the bank that holds the savings of years in riches of friendship. These were questions, I think, of extraordinary sensitivity in a situation where Foote, the, most, the more successful artist of the two, was in a position to help the more diffident and less, perhaps less industrious Gilda make her way as an artist in the mid-70s. Um, and also tremendous sensitivity when by the end of the decade, Gilda's husband was accepting and rejecting, editing, publishing, and of course paying his wife's friend for her writing and illustration. Foote sounds all too aware of the problem of big, big mixing business with friendship when writing to Richard Gilda, Helen's husband. She demands autonomy and yet echoes the greed and malice of Shylock in the following. Let me entreat you not to coach me through that Santa Cruz article. If I cannot make it satisfactory myself, let it go. I can easily work in the pictures, some work in the pictures some other way, so I shall not be disappointed of my ducking. Within this broad narrative of modern culture's promotion and attempted room fencing of, relation, of, of relationship and friendship, though, friendship's cultural script is always changing. In moments at which friendship is accorded, accorded a heightened significance um, and associated with certain societies, Facebook, coffee houses, salons, clubs. In exploring the societies of the 1870s, one of my key examples is the studio of Helena Gilda, a converted stable, carefully decorated, that she called the studio, to which she invited a circle of intimate friends, of which Harold Foote was one. And so I'm trying to form an idea of how this constellation of friends operated, the kinds of signals that were made and withheld, and 
kind of hands-on scene were created to indicate the appropriate atmosphere in which this kind of friendship could flourish. And interestingly, when Mary Hopeful got to Colorado, her first problem, mm -hmm. she created something of the same kind of space. How to link this to contemporary formations is another matter, but it certainly appears from the general literature that historical moments of seismic change, small government, shifting political allegiances, weak national institutions, so the enhanced need to create personal communities. These are conditions that conventionally charge friendship with particular meaning. For me, though, that particular meaning doesn't seem to be necessarily constant with ideas of retreat or comfort or therapy, as is often argued about figures in the late 19th century who set up colonies, clubs, studios, and salons. And I'm not necessarily thinking of friendship as an introspective activity or as locked within a private world, as has the game often been the case, but as having dynamic possibilities for the realization of a range of ambitious developments and experiences. So, where does the letter feature um, in this? Um, as Smith Rosenberg has it, the letters they wrote to each other during these first five years permit us to reconstruct something of their relationship together. As I suggested earlier, talking about, when I was talking about conceptions of friendship and idealization of friendship, Smith Rosenberg's vision of letters um, as a way of accessing in quite a transparent process the self of the writer is in tune with many of the assumptions of the figures with whom I'm concerned in my project. And lots of none, and lots and lots of actual letters were available during this period. And yet, while letters written by Foothill to remind us that letter writing may um, offer an opportunity, as Dina Goodwin puts it, right about the 18th century women's letters, gives an opportunity for the kind of reflection in which personal autonomy is experienced, and indeed in which personal autonomy is given to another subject. And while letters offered an opportunity to make certain experiences count, share memories, revisit secret codes of relationship, and perhaps crevices of eroticism in early friendship, still we see the relationship of friendship between Gilda and Foot, on which so much had depended and continued to depend, continuously constructed and reconstructed in letters, and perhaps not even constructed but negotiated in struggle. What does the following passage from a letter from Foot to Gilda have to tell us about their friendship and how letter writing articulates it? When your letters come, dearest, I always feel I must answer them at once. The thoughts of you that for days have followed me about suddenly become suddenly importunate. And when they find speech, I wonder that I venture to send them to you. They are always the same thing over and over, and it all comes to nothing. I can't really say anything to you that you need to hear. I can only rest my own longing through the outlet of words. I talk about myself a great deal, because otherwise I should talk of you and perhaps hurt you. When I hear you speak of your housekeeping and arrangements for the winter, it gives me a desperate feeling that I should never be able to help you. This opening of a letter seems to me evidently quite preoccupied, as very preoccupied, with their relative status socially and in terms of categories of sensibility. It strikes notes of fear about making any response about what the unintended, unknowable outcome of receiving a letter might be. It suggests that Gilda cannot form the subject of her letter, that Gilda cannot form the subject of Foote's letter. It suggests that while Foote's letter offers an outlet in the form of words, it cannot express the turmoil, indeed the burden of the feelings that the friendship generates. On other occasions, the relationship Foote proposes is quite different. Having written a letter describing her husband's binge drinking and the effort to turn a sober face to the world, to get him to turn a sober face to the world, really, she follows it up with, I must never write to you, this is in the next letter, I must never write to you as I did last time. It is too hard upon me for one thing, and it is not best that I should ever take the dark view. I must keep the best that is possible in sight, at least in my communications. The letter must not only not place a burden of upset on her friends, uh, it must not offer an opportunity for the outpouring of feeling either. In a later letter written from outside Boise in Idaho, Foot executes a subtler move, as it were. Gilda is still the arbiter of high culture and good taste, still the more deserving subject, still the one in the happier position, still the one with status. This is 
what she writes, puts, t- takes a sort of side swipe at Gilda's choice of White House stationery and at Eastern fads and Eastern gentility as an experience of Western barbarity, and juxtaposes the flights of literary taste with the humdrum world of routine cooking and sends her nothing for Christmas. My dearest Helena, I received your executive mansion note and reproached Mr. Tompkins, he's a live-in engineer, for not having left it around Kyrgyz-like at the offices downtown. It would have looked so well. Who knows, but it might indirectly have influenced the local fortunes of the canal in which her husband was involved. Arthur, her husband, is at Snake River for the last time this winter. I pray. It is so cold camping at this season, even with a stove in the tent. That is one reason why I have not found a Christmas remembrance for my dearest and first lady, etc., etc., be the other who she would. Arthur is the one who finds things. I don't know where to go, except to the same old places where there is the same dreary collection of belated Eastern fads in the next page, way of cheap decorative stuff, year after year. I could not see the least thing that looked as if it would do even for me to send to you, my dear. This is one of the most poverty-stricken places in the way of finds. Even the few Indians left do nothing really picturesque. Arthur has a magnificent Sioux War Club skull smasher. The stone hammer is of a reddish stone which the geologists have a name for, but it looks as if it had dulled, a dulled blood stain on it. That wouldn't be an appropriate gift, would it? We have too many barbaric things in proportion to things which speak of sweetness and light, just as we have far too many, in my opinion, books by the specialists. Arthur needs these last, and they're so awfully expensive, there is nothing left to buy, what I call books. So I browse Mr. Tompkins' corner a lot. He has an increasingly good collection of books in his corner of the office. I never read George Meredith. I suppose everyone else has by this time. I say to Mr. Tompkins, now there is a book you ought to have, and he takes out his pocketbook a slip of paper with a list of books and pubs on it, and shows me, for instance, Diana of the Crossways, and says he's coming to that. Every now and again I get a rage for novel reading, but it has not much to feed upon. A few of the great ones make all the rest taste like yesterday's soup meat, which may be very good, but in my domestic experience, seldom is. What part does such a defensive, distancing letter play in the conduct of this friendship? And how are such expressions involved? And what did Helena Gilder write back? Um, A question that uh, Carol Smith Rosenberg does not address, she doesn't quote any of um, Helena Gilder's letters. And I have yet um, to have myself. Finally, friendship, a fictive relationship. The letters of foot to Gilda cast and recast, co- recorded and renegotiated the relationship of friendship between them. But when Helen and Gilda died, Foote set straight to work on a record of their relationship, a fictive record, in which she made Gilda do something that she had never actually done, despite Foote's many requests. She made her Gilda, fictionalised Gilda figure, go west to witness her own life. There were requests that Gilda should come west form a light motif in the correspondence. I have a dream of asking you after a while to try to come out here in the spring, you and Richard. While I'm not here, I cannot wish myself there, for that would mean failure just now. But if you were here with Richard and the children, it would mean only joy. One of my dreams is that you and Richard should come out and spend a long summer where we are in our own house. In Foote's novel, Edith Bonham, the friends only meet, the sort of Molly and Eleanor, as it were, only meet on one occasion after the Foote figure has moved to Idaho. On this occasion, the Foote figure asks her New York friend, the Gilda figure, to come to Idaho to help her. But by the time the Gilda figure has reached Idaho, her friend is there. A moment of posthumous punishment, you were too late, perhaps. But Foote does something odder altogether. Using material from their actual correspondence, Foote takes Gilda, the Gilda figure, to Idaho, gives her a baby to look after, and a surviving baby to look after, and makes her meet her husband. Gilda and Foote's husband did not get on. She makes her Gilda figure deal with the outbreak of scarlet fever that Foote had struggled with. And she sets her in the arts and craft house that Foote and her husband had built. She made her return to Foote's home on Hudson to educate her daughter further, and then she makes her finally marry Foote's husband. If Gilda seemed not to have fulfilled her side of the deal in life, her fictional surrogate fulfilled it in spades. In this version of the friendship, Foote stitched her own and Gilda's experiences together. 
It was the Gilda's children who suffered with scarlet fever, for example, so badly. Exchanged her regret, she exchanged her regret at Gilda's failure to come west with her complete immersion, Gilda's complete immersion in a life there. Um, reorganized their letters, reconfigured their friendship in order to do so. In the late 19th century, in a world in which possible actions and futures proliferated, Foote wrote the very kind of friendship, equal and without condition, counter to what might ever be demanded of a friendship that her contemporaries desire, desired. Two, she, re she reconstructed their relationship into an ideal form, an odyssey of friendship indeed, and one which need never be complicated by the strains and shifts to which friendship is subject. To sum up, and very briefly, it seems to me that the Gilded Foot Correspondence is a rich resource for the imagination and theorising of friendship. For me, it draws attention to all that is in, at stake in friendship and how friendship relies as much on textual forms as on the development of socialities. I'm only just starting to imagine how we can use it to understand the historical moment. Thank you so much, Jim. I know I speak. No.